Welcome to Awakening, an exploration of higher medicine, volume two. This evening, Elizabeth and I will host two great leaders in the higher medicine space. Tonight, you will hear from Charlie Winninger, author of Listening to Ecstasy, the Transformative Power of MDMA. And we also have Safi Zappelin, founder of the Ketamine Fund and the Mind Army. We believe in using all higher medicines responsibly and encourage everyone to find those with the right credentials to help you with your healing journey. Our mission with Awakening is to provide a platform where experts in their respective fields of higher medicine can share information with others who are interested in the same subject. It's our hope that by doing so, that we're not only providing a learning experience, but we're helping to end the stigma around all higher medicines. So we're going to get started this evening with Charlie Winninger, who, in addition to being an acclaimed author, has been a psychotherapist in the private, with a private practice since 1989. He's a licensed psychotherapist and mental health counselor, specializing in relationships and communication skills, treating couples and individuals in his Manhattan and Brooklyn offices. For the past 20 years, Charlie has been a member of the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, which funds research into the use of MDMA, which is also referred to as ecstasy or MOLLY. And this higher medicine has been used to treat PTSD, social anxiety, and other elements. Charlie sits on the board advisors of the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program at the Center for Optimal Living in New York and regularly speaks there on the topics of psychedelics across the lifespan. Although he doesn't use MDMA in his therapy practice, he continues to benefit from personal experiences with this medicine as it informs and improves his performance as a psychotherapist. We're excited to welcome Charlie Winninger. Welcome, Charlie. Hi, Welcome, Gina. Charlie. Hi. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. So when we first met you, Charlie, your book was just coming out, and we've gotten great feedback on our podcast, episode 15 with you, and wanted to invite you to Awakening to dive in deeper um, and see what it's been like to come out of the chemical closet. Indeed. <laughs> so tell us. What's, What's it been, it been like? Been? It's been like crazy, man. It's been <laughs> it's been like a real trip. Um, quite wonderful, actually. I've been surprised at mm -hmm. the uh, how easy uh, the process has been, at least so far. Um, of course, I'm not. I'm speaking mostly these days to a psychedelic friendly audience, uh, so I haven't hit the big time mainstream audience yet uh, where it might get more static, more blowback uh, and conflict. But uh, so far, it's been a very easy and, and happy process because there are a lot of people out there who are interested in the topic and even people who don't do psychedelics are curious about them and they want to hear and they want to learn. Especially with someone, I mean, with your background, I mean, you've, you've been a psychotherapist for so many years. I mean, and, and to be able to be so open and to give this insight and to share this book has been so great. So I'm sure we have some listeners that are really familiar with what MDMA is and what to expect from it. But I think we have some of those curious listeners as well that may not mm -hmm. even be so sure what MDMA is. So I was wondering if we can kind of almost talk maybe specifically to that audience a bit and talk about, sure. you know, what on the basic level, what MDMA is and what it does to the brain, how it makes you feel? Well, methylene dioxymethamphetamine, MDMA, is a synthetic compound uh, that was uh, um, brought into popular awareness in the late 70s and early 80s, starting then. And it is... Um, sometimes cla classified as a psychedelic, but it is more accurately defined as an empathogen uh, because it's, it's not a psychedelic in the classic sense. It's not hallucinatory. Uh, it's uh, closer to, a, to an amphetamine. Um, and 
but it's it's so much nicer than Adderall or methamphetamine or uh, and it opens up the heart area uh, and helps us feel connected to those who are right there around us and helps us feel empathetic with the people around us and floods our body with our own serotonin uh, and oxytocin so that we have a feeling of immense well-being and safety. Who doesn't want to feel that, right? The heart right. center is definitely um, a great way to describe it, just like the amount of of serotonin that goes through your body. It, it's hard not to feel really good um, yes. Yes. when using this higher medicine. Yes. So and many so, people, sorry, yeah, tell us ahead. more. Well, I was just going to say many people still have a negative, you know, their connotation of MDMA, Molly, ecstasy. It's a club drug. Um, so the medicine itself, how is it addictive? First off, is it hurtful? Um, and what are the medicinal benefits and how it's being used clinically? Sorry, okay. that's a lot. In one that's, question. That's, that's a lot, but it's, it's these are very important questions, of course. Um, it's uh, first of all, let me say a little disclaimer here. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an MD. I'm a psychotherapist. Uh, I'm not giving medical advice here. MDMA is not for everyone, and I will talk more about that if you like about who shouldn't do it. Um, uh, and. I'm basically describing my experience, the experience I have with my wife, the experience I have with my friends and their experience. Uh, your experience might vary, might be different. Uh, but uh, I have found it to be a safe and effective compound. Like they used to say in the commercial, safe and effective if used as directed. So uh, uh, it... The, the bad stories that we would hear about, mostly in the past, about Molly or ecstasy, so-called overdoses and this sort of thing, in 90 or 95% or of the cases, it was because there was something, either the compound was adulterated, and there's a way to check for purity, or somebody took way too much, and there's a way to control that, uh, or somebody mixed it with other drugs like alcohol or what have you, and then got into trouble, or they didn't follow the other protocols like hydrating, making sure, because you don't feel thirsty when you're rolling, that's the word we use for an MDMA experience, rolling, and you don't feel thirsty, but you need to hide, keep hydrated throughout the experience. So if you follow these basic guidelines and you, and you can test for purity and you can weigh, the, weigh the, the dosage and you don't mix it with other substances and you keep hydrated, chances are you're going to have, or the people I've known have had not only a good time, but a very useful time, often a very healing time and a time where that helps them bond with the people around them. I like to call MDMA the chemical of connection because it helps you connect with yourself and what's going on with you. It helps you connect with the people around us and the world at large and nature too. So is it addictive? Oh, um, uh, it, it, it generally no. Um, okay. But I should put a caveat to that. People with a very uh, highly addictive personality, where they get addicted to whatever they're doing, um, uh, uh, might want to stay away. Uh, you can abuse MDMA because it does feel very good. The thing is, if you do it today and you like it so much and you say, okay, I'm going to do it tomorrow too, it's not going to feel as good tomorrow. And if you do it the next week also, it's not going to feel as good. You need to space out the time between the experiences. But it can be abused. Uh, and uh, 
uh, you, you can do too much of it. So less is more. And is it to wait in between is because, you know, it's almost like depleting your serotonin then, right? Because there's it, so much of it that comes out during the experience. That's right. So uh, what I do for that, and, you know, I'm especially sensitive to that physically because of my age. I'm 71. So uh, um, I need to recuperate afterwards, which basically for me means getting a very nice long night's rest. 10, even 11 hours for me. Somebody your age might need, uh, you know, much less. But a good night's sleep, mm -hmm. plan nothing the next day, replenish your body, eat well, eat healthy, uh, and, uh, and don't do it again for another month. That's what I would, that's my general rule of thumb. For, for Shelly and I, at our age, it's, we wait two months but for somebody 40 years old or, or younger um, or 50 years and younger, you can do it uh, once a month in, in, in general, which and gives the body time to replenish. Replenish and heal back up. And it's been, I mean, it, I felt like there really wasn't much discussion about MDMA. And then, you know, between what we've been seeing with the MAPS phase three trials and your book coming out and all this buzz kind of happening in the community. You know, it's really exciting to see that it's being brought up, but we're like on the forefront of some big moves. It sounds like, you know, with the FDA and, and, and maps. And if, if you want to talk maybe a little bit about that, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your take on it. It's, 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 it's big news because it's big news for my profession. The psychotherapy profession is going to be turned on its head in the next five years. Uh, because what's going to happen, and it's going to be a big, uh, big issue, and a happy issue with the culture. Because uh, in about two years' time, maybe two and a half years, if things keep going as well as they've been going with the phase three clinical trials, MDMA is going to become a prescription medication in 2023. Wow. And uh, specifically for treating PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but then people will be able, to, doctors will be able to prescribe it for off-label uses. Uh, generally, you're not going to be able to get a prescription, go to the pharmacy, and come out of there with a bottle of MDMA. That's not how it's going to work. It's going to be much more tightly controlled than that. Uh, but you will be able to be prescribe it and then go to a clinic specifically designed to have you sit and they'll sit for you through an MDMA experience so that they can guide you to have optimal results. I was just like, so it's not going to be a microdose that somebody's going to get a prescription to. This is going to be. In it's a, a macro dose. It's a, a, it's a, it's a, 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 a normal dose, which is about 120 milligrams. Yeah. Sorry, Tina. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just thinking about whether or not, because for many people, I think the idea of this being utilized um, a, as a higher medicine to support PTSD, they can get behind. But a lot of people may be unsure of like their set and setting. Do I want to be in a doctor's office when this is administered? Do you think that there will be a time where people would be able to potentially take that medicine home, maybe even participate it with a significant other or someone else? Because we know the impact that it has when you get to do it with someone else. The short answer to that is I don't know. I don't know how it's going to evolve once it becomes a prescription medication. I believe there's going to be there can be such press around it uh, and such a demand built up uh, for people who want to try it and use it that things might loosen up in that way. But it's exciting to think that this is like on the forefront that only in the next couple of years, we could be having such a very different conversation. You know, we'll have you back yes. then and we'll talk about how this has turned psychotherapy upside down. And, and I right. think it'll be interesting to have you back then for sure. Yes. So you did such a great job in the book explaining how best to prepare for your MDMA experience to ensure that you're going to um, feel well the next day. So just wondering if you could give our listeners, viewers, some tips and tricks to prepping for the experience and what is the best way to replenish? I appreciate you saying a good night's sleep. Is there anything else? <laughs> okay, so 
uh, this is in my book, Listening to Ecstasy. There, there's a whole chapter devoted to a guide to safe use where I go into detail about what the mantra in the whole community is about set and setting and dosage. Uh, so to prepare, first the set, the mindset, your frame of mind going in uh, needs to be a good one. Um, you can be excited and you can be hopeful uh, and, and curious. Uh, but if you're in a bad frame of mind, if you're in the middle of a big crisis, not the time to do it, especially not, not to do it the first time when you're in the middle of a crisis. You want your life to be pretty much uh, okay. You might have issues. We all have issues. You all have stuff you want to work on. Uh, and you can set an intention for the journey and to have that specific intention. Although when the medicine hits, you let go and let the medicine take you where it's going to take you. Uh, and so uh, I like to prepare by uh, making sure that my set is right and my setting. The setting is your environment. Best place to do it the first time, home where you're mm -hmm. comfortable and where you can control your environment. I would advise the first time not to do it alone because you're going to feel like you're all dressed up and nowhere to go uh, because it, it, MDMA coaxes you to speak to the people around you. Uh, but you want to do it only with people that you feel comfortable with or a person that you feel comfortable with. Um, and uh, and that uh, is not going to judge you for it. So your set is okay, your setting is okay, and then the dosage and the purity, like I was referring to earlier, you can buy uh, for not uh, for under seventy five dollars. You can buy a testing kit online from a group called DanceSafe.org, just like it sounds, DanceSafe.org a legal kit that you use to test your MDMA to make sure it's pure. If it's not pure, don't buy it and don't use it. Only use pure MDMA. Uh, and I'll only buy it from somebody who will let me test it right then and there. Mm -hmm. And then you measure it and you measure it with a scale that uh, I describe the scale in my book, but there are scales that will measure uh, my, uh, milligrams. And so you want to measure uh, about 120 milligrams or so. Uh, if you find, if you think you're somebody who's especially sensitive to all drugs, make it 90 milligrams, especially the first time. You can always do more, but you can't do less than what you've done. <laughs> And uh, make sure a part of the setup is to make sure you have nothing planned for the next day. So if you work normal hours, you do it on a Saturday. You don't do it on a Sunday. So you have the next day to recuperate. And that's not only to recuperate, but to bask in the glow and to integrate the experience. Integrating is the most important part because afterwards, uh, besides replenishing your body with enough sleep and all that, uh, you want to maybe write in a journal or paint a picture or uh, do and something, if you're creative in any way, to do that. It's a way of just weaving the experience into your, your being. Uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the trick is, as we say, is to how to turn these states into traits, how to turn that wonderful mm -hmm. feeling of MDMA uh, to weave that into your life and have more serenity into your, in, your, in your life, for example. And music so can be a good way to do that, don't you think, Charlie? Like the music that you experience during while you're rolling, like you know, getting to maybe listen to some of those same songs can bring you to that moment where your heart felt so connected to the music. I'm so glad you brought that up, Trina. Uh, uh, music is something that uh, you want. You might want to create a little playlist for yourself before you ingest the MDMA to be ready to have music with a range from soft and flowy and 
luscious like Enya uh, to something with a beat that you can dance to because you might find you want to dance. <laughs> And that's right, Gina. What, what, what the method you just referred to is called anchoring. So if you're listening to uh, something uh, serene, some serene music while on MDMA and let your whole being get, get flooded with that wonderful feeling, then the next day or week or month, if you're in need of a, a little 10 minute, five minute serenity vacation. You can put the, the, your, your headphones on or your earbuds and listen to that same song and recall that whole experience in your body. And that can be, of course, a, a wonderful thing to do. And maybe, Elizabeth, that's how, you know, MDMA got some of those bad raps about being a club drug was that honestly, that people were drawn to the music that the higher medicine brought out in them. And so being to experience that music live, especially in sharing that with other people has such an impact. So taking some of the negativity away from it with being just a club drug, you know, abusing it, like Charlie said, with the overdosing, taking way too much of it or not, you know, taking care of yourself with it. But I do think that it is you know, fair to say that that music element is why, you know, it was so prevalent at music festivals and a part of things is because you're looking for that way to find how when you can grasp onto the, what you love in music, you can bring that onto your daily life. Yes, just like somebody who uh, has uh, used cannabis in their life can understand how cannabis can make music sound, it gives it a whole other dimension. And you hear things that you wouldn't ordinarily hear and appreciate music of all sorts that you might have a hard time appreciating otherwise. So it's the same with MDMA, uh, especially music with a beat. I like yeah. to dance and I love that feeling on MDMA where I'm feeling like half my age and I'm feeling like, not, I'm, not, not like I'm dancing, it's like I'm being danced by a marionette or something is dancing me around the floor and I feel light as a feather and it's an exhilarating feeling for me. I love how you say it takes you back to Youthlandia. <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed. And helps me realize that that vitality is really just right there. It's waiting right below the surface. And often why I don't, uh, I, I hadn't been able to access it as I grew older was because I didn't think it was there anymore. MDMA reminds me, reminds my body that that vitality is really available to me. And so when I dance sober, I can readily just like snap myself right back into that kind of vitality. Love that. And, and with this it. being February and with, you know, Valentine's Day being this month, I, I can't forget to mention that MDMA is often referred to. Um, and even in your book, you mentioned as a relationship glue. But can you tell us why ecstasy has been considered the love drug? Well, because it gives you such a feeling of well-being, it tends to open us up. And so if you do it with a, a, a romantic partner, or somebody you would like to be in a romantic partner. Uh, and hopefully somebody who would like to be your romantic partner. Uh, it can tend to really open the gates and you can speak at a level uh, that is uh, more honest, more authentic, deeper, more intimate than we ordinarily speak to each other. And so... Uh, that's and and if you're if you're in a long term relationship, uh, that's why I like to call it a, a, a like emotional or relationship superglue because it can help bond you by giving you your relationship a whole other level of intimacy because you're bonded at for those hours on a chemical level you're attuned exquisitely to in a chemical level uh, to the same. Uh, wavelength of, of serotonin and oxytocin and all that good stuff and gives you, uh, the two of you, a peak experience together, which is, of, of course, can be very bonding. But just don't go ahead and get married like right afterwards, the day oh, of, after, right? They say like, what was it? Wait a couple weeks after uh, you roll to make okay. sure those feelings are still the same. That's right. That's right. 
don't <laughs> don't 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 get married or make any rash decisions <laughs> within a couple of weeks of rolling uh, or 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 using any powerful higher medicine. You want to uh, get back into your life and then see if those insights that you had when you were high still apply. And I, talking to so many people over Zoom, um, it, it, relationships are hard right now. People have been cooped up together for a long time. And, you know, you hear those splinters when you talk to people like, I just got to get out of here. Or, um, yeah. What a great, yes. a, a great way to reconnect. We're so, in a relationship. We were in a relationship crisis, uh, and yeah. we we were in one before COVID hit, uh, with all a, a number of divorces and 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 how difficult it can be to get along in this world with 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 a partner. But now during COVID, when we're forced to be together for unnatural periods of time, uh, it can bring out all the possibilities of of bickering and 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 and, and tensions between between two people and so mdma can be a nice vacation from normal day-to-day -day reality or the abnormal reality of of quarantining and get the two of you down to a deeper level uh and a more peaceful serene level that you can then call on in, in, the, in the following days and weeks and months. Shelly and I have done this uh, intentionally uh, three, four times in the past year, and it's, it's just helped us give us a little vacation from the day-to-day uh, -day grind of uh, the COVID experience. Hmm. Well, speaking of love, I just, we love you. And we love getting to know you, and you're our hero. And um, you know, uh, we just want to be in touch. We want to be part of your posse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we encourage everybody that's if you have not gotten a copy of Charlie's book, please do so. He spells everything out about how best to prepare. But also, I just think I think of your book as a love story. I really do about mm. just how you know the, the this higher medicine can be a tool to help us not only you know find self love within ourselves and to let go of some of those things that on a daily basis or just make us kind of harder and more difficult with ourselves, but also that potential to use it with someone that you love and, and how it can really, you know, bring you closer together. I think the stories that you have in the book and even like Shelly's first time and her first experience and her getting to kind of tell that herself from her words was so great to be in the book. So we definitely yeah. encourage everyone to make sure that you pick up a copy of Listening to Ecstasy um, by Charlie Winninger, because this is a book that you definitely want to have uh, for in in hand for the next time you decide if you would want to embark on a rolling experience. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to say that the book is really, it's a very personal story. It's not a scientific or clinical book. It's a story about how two people, it, it, it's sort of a love story and an adventure story about how Shelley and I in the early 2000s ventured into the forbidden world of uh, the psychedelic community and found that world to be enchanted and full of wonderful surprises, bigger surprises, the number of wonderful people that we met, open-hearted, open-minded people like the two of you. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, th these people have, over the past 15 years or so, become uh, our best friends. So many wonderful people who are drawn to these medicines. And well, I just, appreciate you. You're so brave. Yes, mm -hmm. you're so brave to share your story that then we can share it and the next one can share it. And and hopefully, you know, more people can have the experience, those that are, you know, that it's right for. And if it's not right for you, that's totally fine. And and you you want to make sure, you know, like Charlie said, this isn't, you know, something for everyone, but we need to end the stigmas around it. And so to really, you know, 
think about these higher medicines in a broader way, even if it's not for you to understand why these trials are happening and how, why it could even become something that could help people with PTSD is just really important for us to share, which is why we want to do these awakening events so that we can offer up a free opportunity for people to really get to understand these higher medicines so that they know that there's nothing to be afraid of. They're here to actually help people. And collectively, we want people to live a healthier and more vibrant life. And thank you so much, Charlie. We always appreciate seeing you and having you. Thank and we you. hope to talk to you again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it very much. And thank you for doing this work. You're doing a real appreciate service you. to people. So I appreciate it. Thank you. We all appreciate it. Thank you, Charlie Winninger, author of Listening to Ecstasy, The Transformative Power of MDMA. Please stay tuned because up next, we have Zappy Zappelin, psychonaut to the stars and founder of the Ketamine Fund. Our second guest tonight is Michael Zappy Zappelin, filmmaker of the documentary film Reality of Truth. Often called the psychedelic concierge of the stars, Zappi helps celebrities, thought leaders, and business icons have a conscious transformation. Tonight, we want to discuss the recently founded organization called the Ketamine Fund, which grants free ketamine treatments to veterans and others who are suicidal. Zappi is a passionate advocate for ketamine therapy. His organization is dedicated to dramatically reducing U.S. suicidal rates by utilizing this powerful legal psychedelic medicine. Welcome, Zappi. It's great to see you again, Zappi. We're so happy to have you here. Um, we enjoyed having you on The Vine, episode 23, and we wanted to invite you back tonight and chat specifically about ketamine. So just hoping you can tell us what ketamine is, how it's being used to treat mental health, um, anything else that we should all know. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. If there's any technical difficulties, I'm on the road in my car, so uh, is what it is. But I will say this, ketamine is the miracle that's going to triage society right now in this mental health crisis because it is FDA approved. Cleveland Clinic called it a top 10 medical breakthrough. The director of the National Institute of Mental Health, Thomas Insel, called it a top breakthrough. And what happened is this is what's incredible is that they realized in on the battlefield many years ago that some of the people that were getting the amputations, they were it was less suicide with those people. And they thought, how is this possible? And they realized it was the ketamine that was disrupting something there. And they Yale University did a huge study on ketamine and they showed that it actually builds new neural pathways in your brain mm. around trauma and depression when it metabolizes. So this is a huge breakthrough, and most people don't realize they think that ketamine is some kind of a synthetic, but really it, it's, uh, it's, they take some salts and minerals and put them together and process it, and a new ketamine crystal grows. So they take that micro crystal, and that, that is the anesthetic that you're, they're using, but in a low dose, it's been shown to break suicidal ideation, which is wow. a huge problem in society right now. Uh, the suicide hotline in Los Angeles calls are up 8,000% over last year, which is scary. Uh, the CDC came out with a report that said that one out of four young people, 18 to 24 years old, have contemplated suicide during coronavirus, which mm. I can't even, if you told me it was you know, one in 50, I would be really scared. But one in four, it's like we need a suicide interrupter right now which ketamine is. And then what's really amazing, the new science that just came out is, this is in Nature magazine, and they showed that ketamine affects this area of your brain called your default mode network. And in there, there's this little mechanism called your lateral habenula. And that lateral habenula is recording all the stress you've ever had in your whole life. And when it becomes too much, your brain goes into burst mode and it shuts off all your dopamine production. So you're getting no dopamine, which is your happiness, your motivation to do anything. So the ketamine, the first time you do it in a medical dose, it takes the brain out of burst mode. You immediately start getting your dopamine back 
and it changes your life. This is why Cleveland Clinic, uh, a rather Yale University said that it's over 70% effective, even in treatment resistant depression where nothing else mm. has worked. And I've had, you know, I've sat with doctors doing this for many hundreds of patients. And it's incredible because the next day, the husband or the wife will call us up and be like, oh my God, he just cleaned the attic. He's been claiming he's going to do that for 10 years. You know, like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And really, it's just that, you know, they started to get their dopamine back. And what's really exciting about it in this renaissance of the psychedelic movement where people understand that these are medicines. This isn't recreation. You know, it's not like marijuana and stuff like that where, you know, there's some part, you know, of this that, you know, maybe people don't think is medical. The whole psychedelic industry is understood to be medical. And with ketamine, what's exciting is it's not a hallucinogenic. Okay, it, so the walls aren't melting and all kinds of scary things. It's a dissociative. So it basically dissociates your left and your right brain, and it allows them to communicate freely without your ego, human ego, getting involved. It's just building new connections. And this is really, really important because, you know, it's not that people aren't trying hard enough right now. It's that, you know, they are frozen in the fact that they uh you know their brain chemistry is off they're being hit with a lot of you know ptsd from coronavirus and you know everything like that and mm -hmm. they are you know they have ptsd and you can't talk somebody out of that and obviously the antidepressants that they've been giving people for the last 50 years those don't work uh in, in a large percentage of people and a lot of harmful side effects so here you have this ketamine and other psychedelics where you're able to use these super safe uh, compounds that are actually growing new neural pathways in the brain. And when you see this under a MRI scan, the brain, and you can see this in a, in a documentation in the UK Guardian, where they showed the brain and you know 80% of the brain was turned on when somebody was having one mm. of these um, these treatments and so you know they always talk about the limitless drug and wouldn't it be great if we had a way to turn our brain on more and here's ketamine and we're lucky enough that it's fda approved it's safe and so the idea is just we got to educate people about the fact that this is the suicide interrupter and that we have a serious situation going on uh with that even a lot of the drug overdoses you know those are just people trying to overdose so that they can die, you know, and what happens what's exciting with ketamine is that usually when somebody's going to commit suicide, they either think that they keep doing exactly what they're doing or they kill themselves. That's their only two choices. And when they have the ketamine treatment and they get into this very calm, relaxed place of what I would call present moment awareness, all of a sudden they see that there's 10 more option sets that they have and they sit there and i've seen it with my own eyes they sit there after and go you know what i like doing this and that could lead to this which could lead to that like i'm not going to kill myself like this is so interesting and there are so many things i need to investigate right now and change my lifestyle and so you know when you see that and i've seen that from people who have bandages on their wrists from being active in that mode People coming from a drug and alcohol rehab center who, you know, they have this experience. They had, there was no way that they could use talk therapy or antidepressants that are suppressing things. They actually needed to allow their brain to operate in a way where it was going to build new neural pathways that say, okay, I'm here and I'm going into the future. And what I've seen across the board is that after they have that experience, when they do go talk to their therapist or their life coach or whatever they're having incredible not just breakthroughs they're in a whole different place they're not mm. talking about what happened 50 years ago and what somebody said or they're, they're just in this new mode of going forward uh and that's you know so powerful that i'm just i feel really happy you know because you see society feel, feel like it's going towards the edge of the cliff but really like right before we get there nature is gonna you know do what it's doing and interject and help us to break through and you know ultimately as you guys know you've seen my film the reality of truth you know there's a lot of other 
things that people may need based on whatever their trauma is. So if somebody is disconnected with nature, maybe they need to try San Pedro, which can connect you to that. If they have a drug addiction, maybe they need to do iboga, which is an African root that can break a heroin addiction, a meth addiction, an opioid addiction in a single session by resetting wow. the brain. And it, the iboga wipes the prefrontal cortex. So these people have no cravings and they have like a window in sobriety to go out there and change their lifestyle without cravings and all that kind of stuff. And that's how people get better. You can't just, you know, very few people are going to just get better because they, you know, toughen up or they try harder or they were just like ready to quit or whatever it is. Most people need this reset of their brain the reset of these patterns because some of these patterns that you have in your brain are uh, you may have even inherited and they're in your dna and you have inherited patterns that you run things through or maybe you're going through you know loops like i'm not good enough nobody's gonna love me i'm a failure i messed up my family whatever these loops and so whatever you're trying to take in that you filter them through these loops it can't be a good thing you need to like dissociate your brain, build new neural pathways and be sitting there like, oh, I'm here in the present moment and I'm going forward. So I'm just like cloud nine right now that we're in So how many mode. sessions does it take with the ketamine? Is it something that, you know, patients have to go through? Do they come back every month and every weekly thing? Is it some, how long do you, does it, does that yeah. take, you know? So that's a really good question. So basically it depends obviously on each person and what they're trying to do, how much, you know, they need to do operationally speaking with the the chemistry of their brains. Uh, the the Yale protocol from Yale University, <clears throat> that's you know, the one that Thomas Insell of the mental health is talking about, uh, Cleveland Clinic. The treatment resistant depression, the protocol is to do six treatments over a two week period and to build up enough neural pathways. And then what you do is after that six weeks, you wait and see how long it is where you felt maybe anything kind of creeping back. And that could be, you know, mm. a month later, three months later, whenever that is, you come in and the protocol is to do one booster treatment to, again, continue to build. And you do one and you've reset. So you're really, you know, building a, building a structure and what I like about that is that, you know, ketamine comes out of your system so fast, it's out of your body within hours. These other mm -hmm. antidepressants, you're, you're taking them every day, they're building up in your system, they're, you're, you're changing your brain chemistry 24 hours a day. The ketamine just is out of your system, you get the benefits, and then, um, you, know, a, you know, down the road, if you need to do some more reinforcing, because again, if you have patterns of heredity and trauma in your brain, you know, think of it like a house. If you need the foundation, you know, reinforced, you know, that's the protocol. What I've found is, and we're testing some different things with doctors where maybe, you know, PTSD, these things, maybe that's just a few treatments. Um, you know, uh, like I said, when you get your uh, brain put back into the right brain state because your lateral habanula put it in burst mode, when that gets taken out, uh, you're in a different place. So maybe it's just one that you needed, you know, maybe you just had to get that mechanism right. undone. And then, you know, so it's really individual. I don't want to, you know, uh, I've seen incredible things and the protocol of six, I think it is, you know, for treatment resistant depression where nothing else has worked. I feel really good. You know, the they say 70% of the people that's going to be good with a booster. Most people are not going to need it to that level, but we all have some kind of PTSD now having lived through this last year. I think, um, exactly. you know, we're living in this PTSD era. Um, is, so is, is ketamine addictive? Uh, that's a good question. Okay. So, um, the answer is from the person who's done more treatments than anybody in the country, Dr. Brooks in New York City. He's done over 60,000 treatments. He said, nobody that comes in for depression or anxiety that does a medical ketamine treatment becomes addictive. He said, you, if you have drug addicts that are abusing drugs and you give them 
some ketamine, they're just going to use it and it'll all be gone. Like they're just going to abuse whatever is there to try to, you know, anesthetize them, you know, from their problems or their perceived problems. So he said he's never had anybody in 60,000 that has become addicted. He said there are very fringe people who are snorting ketamine in a recreational way. And when you snort the ketamine, it goes through your nasal passages, which is not a good delivery system and it hits opiate receptors in up there and so you don't want to do that that's a horrible you know that and that is anybody who's using ketamine you know say recreationally you know that's what they're doing so they have to take a lot of it to try to get an effect and you know it's just again it's not medical ketamine what i'm talking about is if somebody has has PTSD, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, which is about 100 million people in the United States right now, those people can do this and, you know, not feel like they're going to have an addiction. This is something that you, you're not taking as regular as regular pharmaceuticals. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I just want to qualify that sometimes when I hear about people being you know, sober, they don't want to get addicted, they're sober, uh, you know, they're, they go to AA meetings or NA and they're doing these things and they're, in their mind, they're sober, but, you know, I see them, they're drinking eight cups of coffee with 10, you know, lumps of sugar, they're eating a submarine sandwich, they're smoking a vaporizer and they're taking an antidepressant, they're like, yeah, I'm totally sober. And I'm like, that doesn't seem good. If you're, you're living your life, life to try to not feel this craving that you're having 24 hours a day. I would rather use these psychedelic compounds that change the brain, that enhance the brain right now in order to, you know, not be craving drugs or having, you know, whatever cravings are disrupting the person's life. So I think it's, we have nothing to be worried about from a medical standpoint, as long as being done by doctors in the right set and setting with people you know guiding you to have the best experience possible to me this is uh this is the new triage for what we just went through and clearly the antidepressants and things that we were taking prior to the pandemic happening that wasn't working you know those success rates are very low with a lot of side effects so we gotta use the ketamine right now and this associate the people that need it, allow them to build new neural pathways and take advantage of this opportunity that we have that, you know, we have this incredible compound available to us. We just need to educate people. That's why I love talking to you guys, you know, and in even our last, you know, um, conversation was like, this is what needs to happen. It's not that there's some agenda to suppress psychedelics. It's just literally the medical establishment in general society don't know about this you know a lot of doctors don't even know too much about um, nutrition you know so to think that they know about this uh taboo subject that's been illegal for years and years they don't know so it's up to the uh community that has had these experiences and is now working in these compounds but thankfully you know you've got you know, uh, breakthrough status right now by the FDA of psilocybin. You've got MDMA, which is in third stage clinical trials, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelics, uh, MAPS. Yeah, because we were just going to okay. say to you, you know, we we asked some members in our community that are follow us on social media to ask us some questions. So, you know, we we let them know that we were going to be having this event ahead of time. We wanted to see what kind of questions that they would have. And so the question seemed to come up with, you know, how is this, you know, med higher medicine going to become available? Um, some people had said that they heard that it was extremely expensive and wasn't sure how it would have access to a lot of people. So it's curious if you have any idea on like could share like how this is going to work in terms of pricing and availability for people yeah that's a great question so the good news about ketamine is it's very uh standardized and it's very cost effective what makes it expensive right now is that you have clinics out there in you know, beverly hills in new york city and people that have money are going to these clinics and, you know, they're paying $500 to $1,000 for a treatment That's what we and they heard. need a series. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm looking to disrupt that. I have something called MD that I'm developing with 
uh, a group, an amazing development group. And that is to be able to do this at, at home uh, over telemed. And that, that cuts the cost way down so that, that, you know, you can do it for a fraction of the price and people can do it anywhere. So you don't have to be in a big city with, you know, a lot of money. I will say this. If you paid, if you went to, to Beverly Hills and you have the money and you paid the $500 a session, $3,000 and did a few boosters and your life was transformed and you didn't have to go to a therapist, you know, a psychiatrist to talk, you didn't have to take antidepressants. You didn't have to go to drug and alcohol rehab. You didn't have to go to the emergency room on a Saturday night because you're having a panic attack. On and on and on. If that you got that for three thousand, four thousand dollars, it's a great investment. If you, if you say it's it, worth it, it at that but, point, you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if you know, if, if I am trying to with this Ked MD to create a an opportunity, with my partner Warren Gump. Pell and I, um, you know, we've created this because we want to, number one, make it cost effective so people can get it. But we also want to appeal to the millennials because this is a group of people, like I said, they're in a lot, they're in a dark place. Uh, The millennials, they have so much debt and they're just, you know, in a pretty rough place. And so if we can get those, those millennials to do the ketamine treatment first to see if it works for them before they go down decades of antidepressants and dog therapy mm-hmm. and all this kind of you know tms and brain stimulant like first let's do the ketamine treatment and if you're one of the 70 percent of the people that it's effective for great if you're one of the 30 percent doesn't work for then by all means go do whatever it is that you think you need to do but let's make this the first thing and we want to make it cost effective. So I think thankfully it's, it's really happening right now. For That's so people. great. Mm-hmm. So another listener asked us, um, they read about a ketamine nasal spray and wanted to know, is it available and how effective it is? And after hearing you, it sounds like, you know, doing it through your nose is not effective. Yeah, I I don't want to call it not effective. I'd say it's not as effective as it could be, and it could have some harmful side effects to it. I wouldn't want to say, you know, if the doctor said, do that, I would, you know, say, God bless that I have this medicine, and I I would do it if it was regular ketamine. But uh, as as I said, it's not as bioavailable. It does hit opiate receptors. The, the, The new functional ways to do this are in fact, better than that. And it's funny because Johnson and Johnson through their Janssen pharmaceuticals, they came out with a nasal ketamine that maybe this person heard about. It's called S ketamine. And, uh, it's unfortunately it you can only get it through a, um, a, through an insurance company be, being willing to pay for it because it costs instead of, like I said, you know, the ketamine, maybe it costs a few thousand dollars or less coming up. The S ketamine costs like 30 or forty thousand dollars to do and it's only of wow. course paid by the you know insurance companies insurance. so they have some kind of thing going on there mm-hmm. that they like but it's not good for consumers and i would say what's really uh not good is the delivery of that is nasal and they do the maximum dose they can give you is 26 milligrams in one nostril 26 in the other so you're getting 52 milligrams of that, let's say 25% of that is bioavailable. So you're talking about 12 and a half milligrams of ketamine is what you're getting. That's not enough to dissociate you. Mm. And it's not enough the building in these new neural pathways. You want to metabolize more ketamine than that. And because of their drug delivery and the way that they decided that they needed to roll it out to make as much money as possible, they went with this nasal very minimum. And unfortunately, I don't want people to do that and then go, oh, ketamine didn't work for me. I think that's mm-hmm. the case when, you know, maybe, a, you know, a very cost effective you know, ketamine. If the government were giving this to the veterans and the Veterans Administration, uh, it's probably I like, would cost them like five dollars, ten dollars for a treatment mm-hmm. with the ketamine and then a nurse, you know, to, to give it to the medical. So how, how I know do the military. You- Zappy, I'm sorry. I, I, you, I'm realizing that I don't know. Is it intravenous yeah. or? Uh, so the way that you take it in the whole model is a lozenge that uh, that you take at home and, and, and that is absorbed through the mucosa. The way that the clinics do it is that they give you an injection in the arm intramuscular or they drip an IV over 45 minutes. 
Yes. Okay. But what I'm what the reality of it is, even let's say from Dr. Brooks, who's I told you did sixty thousand treatments, he says, I don't care how if you get it medically, I don't care how you get it. You know, if you can get a hundred milligrams of ketamine, dissociate, build up the neural pathways in the hours after, whether you get that through the mouth or you get an injection or you get it intramuscularly, as long as you get bioavailability what you need. Uh, it's the same thing. And so that's also why this is going to kind of, you know, really be big for uh, people because to be able to do it at home, to be guided. And I just want to add this because it's very important to this whole conversation is you want to be in the right set and setting with people who are going to put you in the right headspace. They're going to look out for your environment. They're going to help you to integrate the experience afterwards. Right. And in, in plant medicine, in, in, in ketamine therapy and all these psychedelic therapies coming up, MDMA, uh, you want to make sure you're in the right set and setting, yet your headspace is right, you're with the right people, and you're in the right environment. Or you maybe could have some bad experience that causes trauma. You know, that's why when I hear about people ordering stuff over the internet, you know, ayahuasca sent to their apartment, I'm like, are you insane? You know, that's like, you got to have a shaman who knows, you know, has who has lineage that knows what they're doing so you don't create some kind of trauma. You're trying to use this to expand your consciousness. Don't create a trauma over this. So so what does it feel like when you take ketamine? Is there a, like a, is it a rush or is it a... Um, so feel something? Which, yeah, what's really amazing about it is, like I said, it's not a hallucinogenic so that you're not having these scary scenarios happen and what happens is when you dissociate it becomes like all that ch chatter that's always going on in your mind uh -huh. slows down and then stops and you're just in this present moment Quiet. awareness um, space hmm. yeah that's where you can like take a breath and you know so many people they like never even take a breath they're just like going going and they can't breathe and it's just like to be able to calm that down and sit there for 35 minutes you know, just breathe and to be in that state of mind uh, is incredible. And to be able to look at things in your life from a third party perspective, what happens with the ketamine is when you do come out and you build these new neural pathways, it's not that you don't remember some trauma, but it doesn't have the same like electrical charge on it. So you're just like, yeah, whatever, you know, it happened to me, but it's not me. And you just start moving forward. So it's, it's really peaceful. Uh, most people think it's going to be, because they know it's going to be something very different. They assume that's scary, you know, but in reality, it's like this super peaceful present moment awareness. And then when you come back out of that, the, I, the point of psychedelics is not necessarily what happened, you know, in the experience. But when you go back into your own life of family and business and spiritual and whatever, that you carry forward some of these new pathways and this new consciousness expanded to be able to look at things in a more expanded way. And I think that to me is the power of these uh, things is they tap you back into that, you know, miracle that is life. You know, they give you hope. And I think the key is that, you know, a lot of people have lost hope and in the situation they're in, it's very difficult to see how anything could change. But the fact that these things change so quickly and can expand your consciousness, shift your perception, you know, that, that is the, why these are the holy grail of mental health is because they work quickly. And the benefit is like with I mean, there you've built these new neural pathways, psilocybin mushrooms. You've built these, you know, new uh, connections in the brain. And uh, just to segue to MDMA, because I know it's part of this conversation, you know, for people who haven't had that experience, uh, you know, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Scientists, uh, they, um, this third stage clinical trial they give you the MDMA with therapy at the same time and they're and I've seen this done and the people do couples with it but it's basically like a heart opener you know and people have such a hard time opening their heart because they are in this fear mechanism and they just can't they're not you know willing to open there that these things like the MDMA they settle 
you to a place where you're just your heart's open you can have a conversation about what somebody didn't like that you did or you don't like or common ground it's like this is going to be you know i don't know i can say probably divorce rates will come down dramatically after maps gets the mdma out as far into society as it's going to get really fast because a lot of times that's just a lot of miscommunication a lot of ego a lot of can you know electrical charges on things that don't really have anything to do with anything they're just patterns that your brain is running um you know from that trauma or heredity so this these psychedelics they actually get into your dna and you know in your dna not not only is your lineage stored there but like pretty much you know uh conceptually speaking all the memories of all your ancestors ancestors are in the dna and if you can un and you don't even know that you're reacting to these different things of why you have you know and this has been proven in science where they took some mice and they put on this purple light and then they were shocking these mice and eventually the mice you know didn't go near the purple light and they were all you know ptsd out and they saw that when those mice had children and they showed them the purple light they had PTSD and it went down something like 12 generations until the mouse didn't have PTSD from the light. So wow. we we know that scientifically. We just got to get really cohesive as a society right now and say, "Hey, we're in a crisis. We got mm-hmm. a lot of PTSD. Let's address this. Let's address the suicide epidemic. We know that we have some solutions here. Let's just be smart about it and get these to people as safely and quickly as humanly possible. And so people come to you, Zap, before that, right? I mean, you've kind of been coined the psychedelic concierge to the stars where celebrities and thinkers and people are coming to you. I mean, are you, you know, did they come with you with maybe an idea of some sort of plant medicine or higher medicine in mind that they want to use? Or do they come really looking for some transformational experience and looking to you to help them figure out which higher medicine would work best? Yeah, that's really the case. You know, they're coming to me of course everybody has their own trauma that they're coming to it with and their own intent of what they're trying to do and i kind of see it like you know the reason i'm okay with this moniker of psychedelic concierge is it's kind of like when you go to a hotel and you go to the concierge and you say hey where should i eat dinner tonight near the hotel and they say oh well what kind of food do you like do you like wine do you want to hear live music you know they ask these questions and then they go, oh, you you should go to this place. And so for me, what I've been doing is just having had the direct experience myself, seeing a lot of people having these experiences. I've spent the time with these, you know, thought leaders, celebrities, different, you know, regular folks and said, um, you know, what is your intent and what is your trauma? Because like my formula that I created in the Lamar Odom Reborn documentary that's going to be out soon. I gave Lamar one of these psychedelic interventions. When he came to me, I created a formula for him, which was unique to him, but it was ketamine plus plant medicine plus a daily practice like breathing, meditation, that that doing all of that equals a conscious transformation. So we triaged him with ketamine treatments. Uh, You know, he talked to me about, you know, his mother had died when he was 12 years old. He never really Mm -hmm. processed it. He had a son die at six months old of infant Mm -hmm. death syndrome, never processed friends, family. And so he was in a place where, you know, he couldn't just snap out of that. That's not something he snapped out of. He needed to do the ketamine experience, take the charge off of some of those things identify where he was build up new neural pathways because he had had you know 12 strokes six heart attacks liver Mm. failure kidney damage like he had brain trauma there from that Mm. uh and he needed to repair that cognitive ability and so you know as i as as he got comfortable in doing the academy with the doctors i said you know why don't you you know go down to mexico where the doctors can give you an ibogaine treatment, which is an African root that I said can break a heroin or an opiate or a meth addiction, you know, gambling, alcohol, uh, all these things. And so he trusted me enough at that point and said, I'll 
come with you, you know, and I'll go see the doctor and, you know, well, I'll, I'm going to do whatever they have me do. And uh, I observed that and, and his transformation after was incredible. He reconnected with his kids and he brought his father who he's been estranged from for a long time, who's been on methadone, brought him to do the ketamine treatments to kind of pay it forward. And just, you know, to see that and have Lamar say, you know, what, I, I almost died. And, you know, this, the ketamine experience and the cybogaine, it made me lose my fear of death. And so I get to live the rest of my life, you know, just knowing that this is like, you know, borrow time. I'm on you know, extra time. And so I'm just going to appreciate it, try to live it to the best of my ability. And so when you see somebody in that kind of a scenario, you know, that's what he needed. Somebody else, you know, again, maybe they're out of touch with nature. Most people, they walk in the city with their shoes on. They go in their cement department, wood floor, whatever. They never actually, like, put their feet on the grass or the sand. They don't get that, you know, charge uh, from the environment. And so they're just they're cut off. And then it starts to affect their mental health. And so when I see that, you know, something like San Pedro, you know, to be able to go. And, uh, you know, like I did with Michelle Rodriguez in The Reality of Truth. We went to Peru, we did the San Pedro, and boom, you know, you're connected to nature immediately. And so, you know, I just see all these opportunities, I think, in mental health right now where it's hard with all that technology and the media and stuff coming at us for people's brains to even process what's going on. And so we need these tools to help us to navigate this technology and be in a better place to you know, deal with it uh, without being overwhelmed by it. So I think psychedelics are really going to bring hope back to society and we'll just get a critical mass of people to do it because when people go inside and they come back out, they come out with more empathy. And right now it seems like we're in some kind of having some kind of empathy crisis where there's just, you know, people try to, you know, be compassionate but it's hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes but when you have these experiences and then you actually put yourself in that person's shoes you come back out much more empathy and if we get enough people to do that any problem we have as a society we'll just be able to fix it with that consciousness and you know the famous einstein quote where he said you can't fix any problem with the same you know way of thinking the same consciousness that got you into this situation you have to have a different level of consciousness so that to me means we need to harness these tools and right now if there is a you know silver lining on the ptsd and the coronavirus it's that people have gotten more comfortable with telemedicine and people have gotten more mm-hmm. comfortable with the fact that psychedelics are medicine and that they 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 know that they need to act them and we need this education so we can actively bring that to people right now before we have some kind of a you know suicide crisis that we're not prepared to handle right now mentally speaking as a society i i have another question from one of our um followers uh how important is the doctor or the person who's administering the infusion i mean do you need to find the best in town or is it a standard procedure that you know it's okay yeah. to find I, you know I, this is a very safe compound i thank you for asking that you know there's a lot of doctors been doing it for years who you know they're not psychotherapists or anything like that and they're still having great results um but i do think you know i i would want to do with somebody who's done it before themselves Self. So when I oh, run into mm-hmm. a doctor, you know, and they say, yeah, I do, you know, ketamine treatment clinic, I ask them, you know, have you done it yourself? If the answer is no, then I know, you know, probably they're not going to be able to answer my five or six questions that I have. And I'm going to want to integrate this experience properly. So, you know, you want to be with somebody who's empathetic. You want to be with somebody, you know, who's qualified, of course. But I think if you can find somebody that has done it, it's better than finding somebody who's, you know, the world's best at sticking you with a needle in the arm. I mean, uh, there's a lot of doctors that can do that. The ketamine's gonna work if they do it, you know, in a medical dose, but 
again, you want to get as much out of it as you can, and you want to integrate that experience mm -hmm. afterwards so you can benefit your life going forward. So I think it is important, but I don't want to overstate it. If your doctor said, I'm going to do this right now, I'm comfortable with this, you know, I'm going to make sure you're in the right set and setting, you know, don't, you don't need to go, you know, find somebody else who's, you know, on television or something. That's perfectly <laughs> qualified. Yeah. Well, before we end today, I wanted to also bring up, I know you're, you have all different, different projects, but the mind army has been something that I have not been able to get out of my mind since we had you on the program earlier, because, you know, really, you know, I think even since we last spoke, which was just only a few weeks ago, that there was, I think two more cities that popped up that, that decriminalized nature's efforts have, you know, helped and pushed forward. But it is going to be a so slow process if we're going municipality to municipality across the country and trying to change laws around plant medicine. So I want you to share this amazing organization that you founded so that we can hopefully grow the mind army with um, listeners and viewers from our art show. Thank you. Yeah. So I would invite anybody to join the mind army, go to mindarmy.org, sign a petition to get the, you know, basically what we're asking is the president of the United States, and if anybody has access to him that's watching this, we want President Biden to uh, authorize that in this crisis that people are allowed to access these medicines for mental health in an emergency order. And luckily uh, for us, um, his son, Hunter Biden, who had a drug and alcohol addiction issue, used Ibogaine, the same thing that Lamar used in the movie, The African Root, to break his addiction. So I think if we could just get to Joe Biden one-to-one -one and say, look, we got a suicide epidemic. There's nothing else that's going to triage this. The addiction situation's out of control. Let us, you know, if it worked for your son, then it has to be good enough for everybody else. People should not have to leave the country and you know, to do this, we are, you know, have the crisis here. And I think, you know, just sitting with them one on one, we could easily disrupt the addiction crisis and the suicide crisis with just that one sit down. So if anybody out there can, you know, pass this on, make it happen. Um, the Mind Army is, you know, dedicated to getting this stuff legal right now for the fact that we're in a crisis. And, you know, as far as we're concerned, we're not going to sit here and talk to people about the fact that, you know, alcohol's good, tobacco's good, but somehow, you know, psilocybin mushrooms or some other plant, it's not good. And we're in right. and somebody's telling us we can't use it even if we're in a crisis. No, we don't accept that. That's not medical science. And we're here to say that since 1966, when these things started to be made illegal, LSD and then... In 1971, all of these were made illegal, and they said, we have to study these for safety. And so people were like, oh, okay, you know, that makes sense, makes sense to me. And now, but 54 years later, you know, we know millions of people have taken it, some with a lot of really big benefit. We can't sit here and say, oh, yeah, um, you know, we still don't know whether it's safe. No, we know whether it's safe. We know it works. So you have to, you know, almost like this, you know, libertarian party, which is like, you know, I do what I want to do for my body and my mental health. You have to be able to allow people who are not harming anybody else. They're just trying to heal themselves right now. You have to let them access these naturally occurring compounds to be able to help themselves and their family. It's just not fair. And we're demanding that you know, they take this really serious and admit that we have a suicide epidemic and that it's calling for very bold measures right now. And I would mm -hmm. not have, you know, thought that this was possible at a, uh, you know, a year ago before the pandemic, but I'm now saying, you know, we're coming up on the anniversary of the pandemic and there's mm -hmm. so many people with PTSD, suicide out of control, addiction. Let's be sensible. Let's not sit here and pretend alcohol good tobacco good psilocybin mushroom bad it that, that's not i'm not living in that reality and i don't think anybody who's listening to this should live in that reality if somebody in their family or themselves are hurting and need healing and and so forth i think it's your you know god-given right to you know uh take care of yourself and the mind armies our slogan is 
fighting for the right to pursue happiness. And that's what this is about. So thank you sure for is. a shout out to well, that. Absolutely. And thank you for all that you do for the community and for giving us your time. You know, we really appreciate you so much. You're full of so much information and we can't wait. When is your new film coming out though? You didn't mention that. When can we expect the new film with Lamar? Stay, stay tuned. It's going to be a, just a number of weeks before okay. that happens. But um, we've decided Exciting. that uh, we need to bring it out now and we're going to, you know, uh, take this on ourselves and uh, bring this out because we want this, you know, to get to everybody. We don't want it to be even, you know, um, you know, that somebody doesn't have some streaming service or this or that, or they don't have money or whatever, that they couldn't see this film that could save their life or somebody in their family. So look for that. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you know, I'm at zappyzappolin.com, Z-A-P-P-Y, Z-A-P-O-L-I-N.com and uh, mindarmy.org and let's get these illegal and let's get people educated so that they can you know save their lives and their families lives right now thank you so much Zappy. it's great to see all you. right you guys too we'll talk peace. to you Thanks soon you got to. yeah you guys Bye -bye. are amazing We thank all of you for joining us tonight as we explore higher medicines from two leaders in the industry. Higher medicines are not for everyone, but with knowledge, we gain power for ourselves and for others, and we take control of our own mental, physical, and spiritual well being. And we are not experts, we are students just like you, seeking the truth behind these powerful alternative medicines. So if you are ever looking for resources, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll do our best to find the right person or organization to connect you with. We have a contact form on our website or you can find us on social media. We also have a private Facebook group entitled Plant Medicine Community powered by PMP. So join us for daily news and updates and industry conversations. And follow us on Clubhouse if you're on that new audio app. We are having lots of interesting conversations around cannabis and psychedelics in the space. So if you'd like to find Elizabeth and I on there, you can find me at Gina V underscore PMP and Elizabeth S underscore PMP, which are also our personal Twitter and Instagram handles if you'd like to follow us. But honestly, just reach out to us with any questions that you may have. If you're an industry leader and you want to be involved in one of our awakening events or participate on the Vine, we would love to connect with you. Thank you all so much for joining us for Awakening and Exploration of Higher Medicines Volume 2 featuring Charlie Winninger and Zappy Zappelin. Please keep posted for more content on the Vine a plant media project podcast subscribe today wherever you get your podcasts and for psychedelic news and updates follow us online and join our newsletter at plantmediaproject.com thank you thank you